Good evening. Welcome to this Blood Axe uh, International launch event. Tonight we are welcoming poets from Denmark and Russia. Um, we're going to start with Pia Taftrup from Denmark, and then we will have um, Maria Stepanova from Russia reading with her translator, Sasha Dugdale, and then we will return to Pia Taftrup at the end, after which we'll have a discussion. Um, if you want to put any questions to the poets, you can put them into the YouTube chat and they will then be relayed to me. Um, also, uh, details of the books are given on the YouTube page below the screen that you're watching. So you can just scroll down and you can order them uh, just by clicking on those. So we're gonna start with Pia Taftrup. Um, Bloodaxe has been publishing Pia's work in translation for 20 years now. Uh, the first book we published by her was, was Queen's Gate, which came out in 2001. Um, I think two years after it came out in Danish. And that's one of the things about translation. There is this gap between when they appear originally and then when the translation appears a few years later. Um, Pia's work has been translated from Danish um, by David Macduff. Renowned, translation, a renowned translator of um, Scandinavian languages and, and Russian. Um, her work is conceived usually in um, uh, groups of collections uh, that are formed into, uh, the first case was a quartet and she's now been working on a, a, a quintet. Um, the quartet that she published initially uh, was the Salamander Quartet and that was that took over ten years um, to write and, and publish, and so Bloodax published the uh, translation of the first two parts of it in a book called um, uh, Salamander's Son. Sorry, in a, in a book called Tarkovsky's Horses and other poems, and then the the the, the third and fourth part in a in a in a book called Salamander's Son and other poems. Um, since then, she's been working on a quintet of collections about the five senses. And so again, um, in order to try and keep up with her work, we've started to publish the collections from the new quintet in um, co combined in, 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 in one book. So um, we've just now publishing uh, this book here, um, which is the Taste of, of Steel and the Smell of Snow. And the first part of this is The Taste of Steel. And you can see there the Danish edition. So for the first part of, of tonight's event, um, Pia is going to read from The Taste of Steel. So would you please welcome Pia Taftrup, who's, going to, who's reading to us tonight from Copenhagen. Thank, Thank you. you so much for inviting me, Neil. Uh, I read the first poem in Danish, my mother tongue, and then I will read the rest in David Macduff's translations. Stadia på livets vej. Din elskerinde, der knuste sukkerskålen, er jeg efterhånden ret ligeglad med. Havet vibrerer ikke længere over at have set dig død beruset af forelskelse, men sukkerskålen, som jeg havde arvet fra min mormor, den mangler stadig, hver gang jeg rækker en hånd ind i skabet. Og Søren Kirkegårds stadier på livets vej, som jeg var ved at læse, har hun spillet kaffe på. Bare to sten i den mosaik af ulykker, hun højlydt har forårsaget i det, jeg stålsat troede var mit Hjem. Stages on life's way. Your lover who broke the sugar bowl, I'm gradually quite indifferent about. The hate doesn't vibrate anymore at having seen you dead drunk with infatuation, but the sugar bowl I inherited from my mother's mother. It's still missing every time I put my hand in the cupboard. And Soran Kierkegaard's 
stages on life's way, which I was reading, she has spilled coffee on just two pieces in the mosaic of disasters she has loudly caused in what will steely resolve, I thought was my home. Taste. Taste of sharp winds, taste of gale, of hail and blows of oblivion, of dark of winter steel, taste of the body salt of dry tears, taste of fear of sleeplessness long after midnight, taste of stone of chill flint granite, like taste of the fear of being parted. Taste of tires on highways, taste of shiny trains, metal snakes hung silently through forests, taste of fairies, hull sliding out of their berths, taste of planes taking off, sounds disappearing, taste of melancholy, taste of seed and rain, of one's own language, of new words, of tradition, of migrant birds' caress, of Kierkegaard's thoughts, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, taste of the Kattegat and Skagerrak, of the sound and the Baltic Sea, taste of dialects, tap water, and freedom of speech. Taste of the seasons and the lights changing, taste of oak and beech, of elm and maple, linden and lime, of a straw twiddle between the teeth, taste of silent smiles, of Danish glottal, sound of bubbles, of laughter, of regret, taste of ambiguities, age, taste of center and periphery, of the space in between over which the spider spins her web. Taste of dew in grass, taste of the unarticulated, what is only on the way, the indefinable taste of a secret, taste of fever, taste of restlessness, the taste of biting the sewer berries in midday sun as a child, the taste of memory that can still make the saliva leap, taste of sun, of ice and snow crystals light, taste of squandered life, taste of a newly invented day, the tongue follows lines in an arabesque, taste of raw milk, not drops of an eternity, taste of a farewell kiss, the final words of dizziness at sea and sky, the earth rotating. Earring. I can't really ask a husband to repair the earrings I got from another man. For hours I've tried myself to wiggle the little clip in place but it still won't take hold in my ear. My fingers are at work, my soul is working overtime. The other man gives me earrings from a stall in a piazza in Rome. They are oval, they glow like a consummated sunset, but to repair them is also unthinkable. There is no time for repair. I could have been more cautious with that gift. To make me a present of earrings was not what the first man would do. It would never occur to him to give me earrings such a long time after the wedding and certainly not to take me to Rome, but he's good at repairing things. For a whole lifetime, he has repaired my life, kept me going with but mostly without earrings. The darkness machine. 
the child should be running around in the sun. It should be playing, not struck in the back by a bullet, not paralyzed from the waist down by a wall whose shiny metal penetrates the sound of the words with the gray tent of vengeance and whose conflicts haunt the heart, settle like moon colored scars on a whole generation. The anonymous part of the churchyard. In the anonymous part of the churchyard where there are no marked graves and no gravestones for the dead, my mother has bought herself a place in eternity near the tree beside my father. That place no one else shall have. Here my father waits. In my mind, all the fields lie fallow. The forests have been cut down, but the sun still rises and sets. Good morning, good night. The horses eat out of my hand. The wind gathers up with the words I seek. Mother tongue. I burst into loud laughter in my mother tongue. I am understood in another country. My friends laugh back in their language. I cry in my mother tongue. I am understood in another country, comforted by arms that cradle me. Word and soul. The words in the book penetrate an armor. What I read burns like a field of ice and blood, is tattooed in without death pain, penetrates the mind. How do letters and soul meet? Thought and soul, how does the soul find meaning in words, which may have found their way without the writer knowing from where? And now, across the papers time, take root in me, taste them. The words exist. They can be retrieved from a place that is by no means an overgrown wilderness. There's room for more words. The space in the brain is apparently no smaller than the universe. Separation. The moment I begin to love, the separation starts, at least the fear of separation. The fire grows in the blood. I can't turn back, can't remain. The condition reminds me of the unrest that sits in my body when I have slept asleep that does not make me more awake. My pain is not yours and vice versa. Yet it is not impossible to distinguish your pain from mine when I look into your eyes and you look into mine. I throw myself out. No one can hold me. I simply fall deeper within myself. A decision is possible. It exists in me like a freedom greater than myself, but it is mine alone and therefore a prison. As long as a pain pierces through, it's not over. And the last poem in this section, early morning. To pull up the blind after a pitch black night with dreams of destruction, see that it's all there, the houses, the trees, the birds, figures walking on the road in the early morning light when a blood-colored rose hip becomes the center of the world. Thank you, Pia. Um, well, that's certainly a very good uh, transition now to hearing Maria Stepanova. There are poems there like the, the churchyard poem and the, the child in war 
which certainly make a very good transition into hearing from uh, Maria Stepanova's uh, The War of the Beasts and the Animals, which she'll be reading from with her translator, Sasha Dugdale. And they have also just published um, In Memory of Memory, which no doubt we will be talking about in the discussion at the end. Um, that is billed in some places as a documentary novel, but it's much more a memoir and it's very much about the past. And um, I think you'll find when you've heard both poets tonight, um, how much their work relates to family and time and mortality and war. Um, all those things are kind of mixed in together. Um, War of the Beast and Animals is uh, a collection from several books which uh, Maria Stepanova has published in Russia. Um, there are two very long poems in it, uh, Spolia and the War of the Beast and the Animals, uh, which came out of the Donbass conflict relating to the, the Russian uh, intervention in Ukraine, uh, which you'll no doubt hear about. Um, what I think we should do is I'll introduce Sasha Dugdale next, and she can then um, lead the reading with uh, Maria. Uh, they're going to read in a kind of overlapping style. Uh, it's a long poem, so they're going to break it up by reading it in chunks together. So would you please welcome uh, Sasha Dugdale and Maria Stepanova. Um, Sasha, we need you to, I think you're on mute, you need to be oh, heard. No, I'm fine, sorry, no. Neil. Yeah. No. Um, thanks very much for the introduction and uh, for all the explanation. I think that the, the plan was this evening that we would read together and Maria would start by introducing the poem, where the poem came from. Um, and so I, I think I'll probably um, hand straight over to Maria to talk a little bit about War, and the, War of the Beasts and the Animals. Um, hello, good evening, and uh, lots of thanks to everyone who is here this evening listening to us. And I'm overjoyed and honored to be reading in such a company and uh, to be celebrating the launch of these uh, beautiful books. Uh, I have to say that mine is still to reach me because the post is going extremely slow nowadays, especially to Russia. So uh, I'll show you the Russian version of the same book containing these two poems, the uh, spoiler and the word, the beasts and the animals. And uh, we'll be reading uh, some, some fragments of the second one which had started with a strange sensation uh, 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 I'll try to share. It was uh, mid-August in uh, 2015. And I just came back from, from Europe, flying via Amsterdam, where we, well, where we have witnessed a whole uh, airfield uh, full of... Uh, burning candles and flowers and uh, kids' toys commemorating the crash of the Malaysian Boeing and the, 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 the kids who died in the catastrophe. And then I arrived to Moscow, that is my hometown. I've been born there and I didn't recognize the place. It was eerily different. It was overheated and uh, somehow hasty as if a huge summer festival was going on. And all the women in summer dresses and their guys, uh, you know, holding their, their beers. And it felt so strange to know that uh, all this is happening in the context of an ongoing war in just a few hundred kilometers from, 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 uh, from the squares and back streets. And uh, this easy way of living together with the war, easily speaking the language of war as if it was a mother tongue, it made me see something, something new in the, uh, in the whole 
body of, uh, of Russian poetry. And uh, while writing uh, this long sequence, what I wanted to do was to make this um, constant presence of war entering, penetrating the uh, peaceful life, I wanted to make, to make it visible, to make it uh, seen and uh, somehow understood. You cannot really understand it, but you can make an approach. I, I think we, we talked a lot about the poem when we began, when I began translating it and um, one of the things we talked about was how to convey the modernism of the text and the polyphony. There's so many different voices in this text. And um, uh, Maria, you gave me permission to recreate some of those voices in, in a much more English fashion with English cultural allusions or English language cultural allusions, which was very freeing um, somehow. And I think that the, the moment that I found a route into the poem, and I've said this several times publicly, and it's in the foreword to War of the Beasts and the Animals. I talk about at length how the political situation in the UK in 2016, 2017, when I was translating the poem, helped me to find the words for Maria's exquisite poem in English. Um, but I just want to say before we start, I can see the beautiful Moscow night sky behind your shoulder and it's making me so sad not to be there. <laughs> I'll, I'll hand over, Maria's going to start reading and then as Neil said we we kind of overlap, we haven't done this on Zoom yet um, as perhaps consummately we did it in in the flesh at Pushkin House but I think we'll we'll, we'll nail it tonight, yeah? Okay, let's try it. So you are the one to be starting, yeah, right. Oh, I am. Yes, that wasn't good, was it? Okay. Is <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the epigraph. War of the beasts and the animals. Look, the spirits have gathered at your bedside, speaking in Lethian tongues. Hush a by, so flesh and fine. For what do you long? Я улыбалась. Он мне сказал, Марусь, крепче держись, Марусь, и мы полетя. I smiled. He said, Маруся, Маруся, hold on tight. And down we went. November, the cruelest month, the horsest mouth, driving from the dead clay, peasants forged to the field, cows, curs, leaving over their dead body, the post bag snagged in the stream, the tin spoon, the quick streams, slipping the quicksilver, slip sliding away to the estuary. This little piggy went to market, and this little piggy froze to death, and the landowner put a gun to his head, and a black car came for the officer. Grek is Odessa, Yevre is Warsaw, Yumni Karnet, Sidoi General, Мальчик юнат, летчик Гастелла, каждый, кто здесь помирал. Out of the murky pool, the surface still warmed by the sun, in a night in May, steps Rus Alka and quickly begins her work, throws her wet clothes from her, tramples with her wet feet, her black body shines, her white smock cast. Mother, mother, is that you? Alyosha, I don't rightly know. Oh, swallow, swallow, is it her? She flew away, my friend. Как бы я под ним кончала, говорит одна, а я все слышу, и вторая говорила, не молчала. I can just imagine coming under him, says one, and I can hear everything, and the other is speaking, speaking, Fruits of the curbside, reads the jar label. From whatever takes root in the stony rubbish, embers, sawdust, scorched wood, suspended in sweet amber sugar, cockerel-shaped lollies for the day of the dead. When I'm off to market or when I'm coming home, I always remember what she said back then. One leg crossed over the other, who goes on top? One leg vows to the other, I'll top you. Нога на ногу пошла войною, какая сверху, 
Нога ноге обещала, я тебя свергну. How little earth was saved on the bosom of the earth. Lift the corner of the blanket, replace the hot water bottle, measure perspiration, water, allow reach for it, deep indraft, ditch after dugout, dogged, indrafted. Как мало земли спаслось на груди земли. Отойми уголок одеяла, грелку поправь, умерь испарину, дай воде дотянуться, делай глубокий вдох, ров в ров, ровно, коровно. Say the word that don't belong, put it on and march along, forget the old and step anew, and the word will march with you. That word it curls up and dies at your lips as it emerges, like the spread eagle toad, it lies in the heat on the verges. It clots sticky in the mouth, froths, issues. Here, let me wipe out, it's in the tissue. Ah, with it, ich, ah, and gagging on. They don't half mean anything. When they die, they're gone. Blue wings thrown aside under the weight of the sky, the eagle floats over the forest, undulating in the air like a place divested of alphabet. Вдали у реки догорали огни, усни мое сердце, усни, не трать керосин, потуши свечу, не будет, как я хочу. On the 22nd of June, at four o'clock on the dot, I won't be listening to anything. I'll have my eyes shut. I'll bury the foreign broadcast. It's the news, but I won't lift a hand. If anyone comes, I'm out of the loop. I'm a sparrow. I'm no man's land. Нету разницы между первой и второй. Отечественный и отечественный, великой и тихой, атлантической, мировой. No difference between first and second, patriotic or patriotic, great or pacific, Atlantic, world, all the same they fall to the only, the civil, where sunrise quivers in the cinders, draws out the spear tips. Mate, hey, mate, gives a light says the dead to the dead, says the killed to the killer. Кто там едет по Васильевскому спуску к храму Василия Блаженного? Страны рады, грады наряжены. Who is that riding onto Red Square towards St. Basil's Cathedral? Countries rejoice, cities jubilant across my territory. Begins two minutes history. Vixens bark at the crimson shields. Mosquitoes drone drowns out the pealing of bells. Russian hares in all the polling stations. The country has spoken. And then the midges tearing themselves from flesh rotate tactically overhead. Who wouldn't want to be drinking the quiet dawn from grandfather's wooden cup? Going back in time, rub your eyes, put kebabs on the fire, reclaim those words, sprinkle on them, sprinkle them on soup, sprinkle earth. Влас доброволец, две недели как мертвый, забыл курс рубля, и что воробьи говорили, и откуда он сам. Взрывная волна взяла его кости в объятия. Пока он летел, годы съезжали с него, обнажая детские щеки, прибарматывая. Ватник или укроп, кто бы ты ни был, на этом заброшенном переезде, вспомни о Власе. Влас был тебя милей. Влас, the volunteer, a fortnight dead, forgot the ruble rate and what the sparrows said and where he was from. A current of explosive air held his bones in embrace. As he flew, the years passed from mm. him. 
chubby-cheeked, babbling, Ruski or Ukrainian, oh you, whoever you are in this neglected crossing place, consider Vlas. Vlas was nicer than you. Мы не немцы, не мы немцы, шерстью крыты их младенцы. No man we, not become, we no German rage blood. Мы не рыбы, рыбы не мы, с ними можно делать мены. No thing we. No skull, we, no house bird, no cherry tree. Мы не мы ты, мы не мы же, в роще мир ты, сплю и вижу. Beyond, behind, spoke and word, rush and bear, melodies. We know a, not straight away. And Mother Demeter, mithering in the muck and anguish of the fields, hears from below, Mother Fuck, yet the sky might be brightening, or so it feels. A Mother Hecate comes out for a smoke from the back street, from the foul black streets, from the pecking fowl, the puddles of spilt milk. The earth lying like a kit bag behind enemy lines. Give it tongue, Mother Mary hurries but hasn't yet come. В духе бурня, в голосе хлада тонко, та, что Левиафана берет на ручки, как маленького ребенка, и та, что идет по ржи, присутствуют при этом происходящем, смотрят, не отводя, молча. Like the tailor who sews, not the straight jacket, which from childhood has begged to sit up, woken from the canvas, but the pattern cuts on the bias, and the dress isn't tight, just itchy. Like a court proceeding down the long hospital corridor with a heavy trolley, handing, handing out the tightly wrapped packages, the little living weights of verdicts, three per cord ladies, like when in a moment's confusion you spit out a barbed word and it lodges in a tree body or the body of a comrade or a friend lip and the line goes taut. Fish hooks a fish. Like a mound under a snowdrift means nothing. Writing on a tomb sees no one. Writing on a stone, nothing. We read it not but it is. Это так. Холм под сугробом ничего не значит. Надпись на табличке никого не видят. Надпись на камне ничего. Читаем. Его нет. Но здесь. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Sasha and Maria, for that wonderful reading. It was lovely to hear the, how the poem sounds in Russian. Um, I'm now going to turn to um, Pia, who's going to read from the second book in our book, which is The Smell of Snow. So you've had the taste of steel, now you'll have the smell of snow. Pia. Yeah, thank you. And again, first in Danish. Din duft vækker mig. Havet vender sig tungt i søvne, da du træder ud fra badet, elskede. Når du som lyset vælger den korteste afstand hen imod mig, kommer duften før dig. Varmen fra huden overbeviser mig om fornuftens utilstrækkelighed. 
Din duft vækker noget usynligt i mig, bedøver den mindste tvivl. Du kommer som natten, der braser ind i dagen, men har stille ikke en lyd høres. Du berører mig med din duft ømt, piger mig med din duft svimmelt. Din duft får mig til at føle mig mere nøgen. Jeg ånder ind lettere end før. Der er bare én krop, og den nærmer sig nu. Rummet er fyldt af dig. Det omslutter mig blindt. Endnu ikke smagen af dit kys. Endnu intet kærtegn. Kun bølger af vores dufte. De mødes, de blander sig, får rummet til at ekspandere og trække sig sammen igen. Du kommer til mig som natten. Den tager så meget, den vil af dagen. Sletter dagen snart. Your fragrance wakes me. The sea turns heavily in its sleep when you emerge from the bath, my love. When, like the light, you choose the shortest distance towards me, the fragrance moves ahead of you. Warmth from your skin convincing me of reasons in equatici. Your fragrance wakes something invisible in me, deadens the slightest doubt. You arrive like the night that bursts into the day, but here is quiet, not a sound is heard. You touch me with your fragrance tenderly, tickle me with your fragrance giddily. Your fragrance makes me feel more naked. I breathe in more easily than before. There is only one body and it is approaching now. The space is filled by you. It encloses me blindly. Not yet the taste of your kiss, not yet caresses, only waves of our frequencies. They meet, they mingle, make the room expand and draw me back again. You come to me like the night. It will take as much as it wants from the day. Erase the day soon. Seduced by Gregory Pincus. Doped by years of the pill and as a result with badly disturbed senses, I allowed myself half anesthetized and with a slumbering soul to be kissed by a man whose smell was different than I noticed later sour. Where did it go wrong? No warning traffic lights for driving on sexual roads flashed red in nights of dream dust and shooting stars. The fear of fear was totally erased with Gregory Pinker's pills. With my basic smell, I maneuvered blind, had children who luckily for me smelled blessedly of mine. <clears throat> Caught in the act. The fish catches its food and itself is caught, has its head cut off with a cracking sound. The smell of fish blood rises while under the knife the fish still twitches. The light bones and feathers lie scattered among grass and stones where the birds circle in the air, smell its way to the earthworms in the soil before the marten consumed its meal. On the grassy plains, a hungry wolf goes after the sheep's bellies and gusts. On the carcasses, the ribs are gnawed away, flies and worms take care of the last remnants. In the dust among the rubble of war, the wounded lie. I recognize the smell 
when an angel breaks. In the dust among the rubble of war lie the dead, victims of a bloody hour who once lay in wombs must now be placed in the grave, infinitely close to our hearts. Breathing collision, the locations accumulate, rocks and clots of earth, the whole world is a crime scene. Reflection on snow and ice. The smell of snow is good. The snow tells no lies. It's there when it's there, like a snowstorm or a chorus of snowflakes in the air. Is not like the sign on the shop door back soon. The snow settles as a greeting from a distant sky. So far away my nose snips it in. My blood is lit up by the snow. One thought grasps the next without a not being tired. Walk upright through the snow in icy cold. My boots gnaw at my heels. The sun makes the crystals shine. A blue purple shadow stands out in the white, which even in the darkness tries to light the landscape. My boots sink into the snow with each step as if solid ground were missing. Think of polar bears hunting for food, of reports that male polar bears have started to mate with brown female bears because they sense instinctively that the ice is melting and only females can teach they're young to survive. The winter has ridden off the snow. It's not just the delete key that has removed it with a single click. It fell on, it fell on, but a few days this year covered the earth and the heart only just. It was simply my brain that formed it from a single syllable. I, who dreamt it, dreamt that I walked in snow and frost, in the boundlessness, weak and happy, afraid that the snow had left the world after reading about melted ice at sea, about how polar bears stranded on land must survive on body fat from the spring hunting and now make do with birds, eggs and berries. Think of polar bears hunting seals and fish. Think of snow as drops, ice as drops. The ice at the poles melts slowly. I learn to draw breath in scorching heat. Water flows. And the last poem, the stream of smells from below. Of the planets, more than seven billion faces, no two are identical. Even though there are similarities, each stand, stands out from the billions of others. Each person is completely their own with experiences that resemble others and yet have their own distinctive character. Together with everyone else, each person is the only one equipped with their own mouth, nose, eyes, ears, skin. Each person is referred to their own sensations, as I am now with the sun in my face, June, and with the chill in my back. Stop to bow down to the earth where I sowed seeds bow to the flowers at my feet, breathe deeply, sniff in the smell, just as the more than seven billion like me around the globe now and then bow to the earth to inhale the fragrances that flow gentle <clears throat> or prickly as pine needles in the nose. Thank you very much, Pia.
So we've had a wonderful reading so far with a lot of senses happening tonight. Uh, not just taste and smell, but to sound, to hear the, how the poems sound in the original language, which I think has been quite wonderful. Um, we're going to move into um, a uh, collective room, uh, uh, so we're all going to be able to take part in the discussion. Um, if you have uh, questions uh, or comments, do put them on the chat and they'll be relayed through to me. Um, so I'm just going to wait now for a second while we all get moved into the same area of the, uh, the Zoom room. And I think, um, can I ask uh, Sasha and Maria to turn on their videos and their sound? And I think we're all going to be on, we're all together now. Yeah. Um, we've had some interesting comments coming in uh, and from all over the place. We've had Leanne Quinn in Munich sending congratulations to the poets and their translators. H.C. Uh, Anderson, no less, in Newcastle greeting <laughs> Pia, <laughs> a, a different H.C. Anderson who's not risen I from like the dead. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Victoria Kenefick, uh, greetings from Kerry. Um, and a number of people have just been saying where they are. So we're bringing in people from all over. Um, there's a question about um, Danish that we could start with from Ken Evans, who um, wants to know if it's true that Danish is short on descriptive words compared with English. And if so, um, is it liberating to think in English or conversely limiting to think in Danish for poetry? Is, or is there freedom in that? I mean, it's a bit of a difficult concept, that. Um, but perhaps we could lead into um, Pia talking about how she works with David Macduff, her translator. And I'd like to pay tribute to him tonight for the wonderful, this wonderful translation and all the other wonderful translations of his that we've published. Um, there's also the interesting question that a publisher always has that, um, translations never seem to be finished. Um, you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you get the final proof, but then inevitably there are further changes because unlike a poet in the original language, the translator never feels that the translation is, is actually there. And every time the translator goes back and looks at the translation, there's always something that they want to change. And in fact, tonight, Pierre, when you read the poem Taste, um, at the end of the poem, which ends on the Earth's rotation, you you actually said um, the Earth rotating. Um, yeah, I made which, a mistake. But, but sometimes I feel as though you're actually when this does happen. Sometimes it feels as though this may be a previous reading, and you're so used to the previous version that when you get to the published version, you're still thinking of the previous one. No, it was not the, the situation. I'm simply so nervous <laughs> about right. reading and the, uh, without the audience here in my room. Uh, so I, 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 I did a few mistakes and I, I noticed that one, but I right. thought I, I did not uh, want to correct it because it would be understood. But yeah. I would like to answer the, the very good question you got. Uh, uh, when uh, when I have a Danish poem uh, with some long lines, it will always uh, come out smaller in English, and that's what I like so much about be, to be translated into English. I find it more condensed and very precise, opposite to French. The la, all the small words, uh, the lines are growing, growing. Uh, so there are there are. Uh, big differences between the languages and it's very interesting to uh, to study but uh, i but in in when it comes to the english they are the the lines will be smaller at least when david uh, translate <laughs> because he is so precise and uh, has almost the sa same process as I have, throwing away, throwing away, uh, uh, in order to condense when he is translating. So he is uh, he is sending his first version to me, and I put some questions. I I never come with suggestions because I'm not able to do that. Uh, I ask, uh, can we have another word here and there? And 
and he will answer. And we have many emails to and fro. And little by little, the, the poems uh, develops. And uh, I think we end up with a poem which could have been born in English. And that's the fantastic thing about David that, uh, uh, yeah, I, I love these poems so much and they, they, they could have been written in, in English if I mastered English, but I don't. <laughs> they do read very well in English, but I think there's also something that David does because of his understanding of the sound of Danish is he manages to choose vocabulary that very often captures something similar to that sound in English, doesn't he? Particularly the uh, vowel sounds. Yeah, he's very good at that. He's very good at listening. And of course, I, I can hear that Sasha is doing the same. I mean, the translator has to do that. Uh, um, I think they, if, yeah, it's, it, for me, it's interesting to hear Sasha as well. Um, but they, uh, they work also, I think you also work different, Sasha, from David, because if I would have a, a quotation from a Danish uh, uh, poet, let's say that, which he, he or she was not known in England, I think uh, David would stick to that person and not choose an English uh, example. But I think that you are very faithful towards uh, Maria in the what you choose, but it's a, and it's a, a freedom to do that, but uh, interesting to discuss uh, what it means to, to, to leave the Russian names and stuff and, and uh, transform into the English. Asha, would you like to pick up on that? Um, I think that the each poet need, demands, or each poem even, but certainly each poet demands a different sort of translation. So the approach that I took uh, from Maria's poems um, here, I wouldn't necessarily do that with a different poet, but it was also partly that Maria gave me a lot of permission to translate with um, freedom. And that was incredibly exciting. And I think the other thing that's worth saying is that um, Maria's English, and I'm sure you picked this up when she was speaking, is so brilliant and so literary that everything I did, I knew that if, um, she was happy with it, then that, that was kind of good enough for me because um, I know that she's so uh, well, well read really in English literature that she has a sense of where the poem belongs, um, not just in Russian, but in English too. So it was a huge uh, stroke of luck really that I could translate um, Maria's work. Well, Pia talked about yeah, yeah. Her, David McDuff's translations reading almost as though they have been written in English. In many ways, I feel with your translations of Maria, you are continuing the poem in English. You are adding to it. Um, in fact, Entensberger used to do that uh, in his translations where he was translating his work from German into English and knowing English so, so well, he would actually continue writing the poem in English and, and actually going away from his original German. And I feel as though you do that to some extent, particularly where you're changing the folk basis of uh, folk references and, and that kind of thing. Well, um, I think that's really interesting translating Maria because well, I'm, I, I want to sort of pass this on to, to her, but the, it strikes me that quite a, the basis of the translation is in the many conversations we've had and talking about all sorts of things really. Um, and that transfers into literary translation, the sort of conversations at the kitchen table um, moves fairly seamlessly into translating the work. So um, I, when I'm translating particularly in memory of memory, um, I could hear Maria's voice very clearly and all the things that she was saying. So it, I, I had that voice in my head, which was, which was wonderful, but it's, um, it, it, yes, um, every, translation, every translation is different, but I've been particularly lucky here because uh, Maria's work is not just important to me um, because of its cultural weight and significance, but it's important to me as a poet too. So it has an effect on how I write and how I think, and it moves me on as a poet. Um, perhaps I could ask Maria about the relationship between the poems and In Memory of Memory. 
because there's so much common ground between them. And it's almost as though the two books are in dialogue with one another. Uh, maybe I, I think uh, I think you're you're right, of course. And uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, it is uh, maybe it's a weak point after all, because uh, well, I belong to the type of a writer who is always trying to answer the one and the same question, endlessly making circles around uh, some subject, some idea, something that you cannot exactly put on your finger on, but still you're obsessed with this, with this sort of thing. But I wanted to, you know, to catch uh, Sasha's, uh, uh, Sasha's notion of, of uh, translation as, uh, as an ongoing conversation, because I consider myself to be the lucky one, uh, because this conversation we're having while translating, while simply talking, while exchanging ideas uh, is, uh, well, it is something I cherish. It is enlarging and enriching my own territory, the realm of my own writing. And uh, in a way, maybe that's the only idea of translation I, uh, I'm ready to, 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 to hold on to because there is something well, there is something, uh, it is somehow close to the idea of a poetic sequence, of a cycle, of a series, uh, because you are never satisfied with just one poem in its entirety. You are moving on, moving forth. You are expanding its space to become something longer, something bigger. It, uh, it opens some new corridors, it is transforming itself into something new, rich and strange, whatever. And uh, that is, uh, I suppose that behind uh, the process is this idea of translation as exploration, translation as uh, uh, this soul enlarging, mind expanding business of making things bigger. And that's what Sasha does to, to, to the stuff I'm writing. And uh, I'm mesmerized with the results because when I am reading uh, the translation of my poems, I don't want them to be actually precise or exact. I want them, I want to be able to read them as a newborn poem that doesn't exactly belong to me. And uh, and how it works in this case, goodness. <laughs> I've got a question from John Glenda in Scotland asking Maria if you could talk, uh, talk about the significance of Sakratiki. Mm, uh, I'll try to, but um, well, uh, uh, then I'll, uh, I should start with an explanation. Uh, Sakratiki, it is a uh, a kid's game uh, from the late Soviet years when I was uh, when I was a school kid, and it was a particular girly thing. Uh, it wasn't well. It was a time of uh, well modesty and bareness, and uh, there was not a lot. There was not a, a lot of beautiful things around. So we were creating some things of beauty for ourselves. And what you were supposed to, to be doing is uh, making, digging a small hole in the, in the ground and uh, putting some tinfoil inside. And then you were placing in all the beautiful things you were able to find, like birds, feathers, uh, shells, um, ribbons, uh, tiny mirrors, whatever. And then you were covering it all with earth and trying to forget about it because it was a secret, secretiki, a tiny little secret that you had to share with the closest ones. It was not open to the outer world. It was something to be hiding. Uh, and um, da, 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 that's a starting point and uh, well, I, I suppose it has, um, da, da, there is a lot of things to talk about, but uh, uh, the one thing that interests me right now, it was a hidden realm of beauty, 
uh, in a hostile world. And uh, still you were not supposed to be placing it uh, behind the closed doors in your apartment. It was staying, it was to be staying an open secret, ever vulnerable, ever endangered, but still being there shining from, from under the earth. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful idea. Um, got a question for Pia from Neil Munro in Oxford, uh, who says, I know you, you published these collections in Danish in 2014 and 2016, but many seem to speak directly to our current pandemic experience. Do you think of them differently now? Um, and in one of the lines of your poems, you talked about the whole world being a crime scene. I think that's something that's common to, to both poets, uh, both poets' work that we're hearing tonight. Um, do you do you think of them differently now in, in the light of where we are now, Pia? Uh, there was something in the quiz, in what you said, I did not get, Neil. Uh, the fact that they were published in uh, several years ago, uh, but they seem to speak to our current experience of the pandemic. Uh, exactly that poem. Um, the collections, the, b b both of the collections. Uh, okay, so uh, he, uh, he means the Danish collection compared to that they uh, uh, appear now in England? Or? Well, uh, just that um, the way they read now, it's almost as though they could be written now rather than th that many years ago. Um, I'm not quite sure what Neil is referring to um, because the way the question feed works, I, I can't get him to elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I but I mean, there are, you know, for example, the taste poem, it's, it's all about the things that are precious in life that we can taste. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's the kind of thing he's, he's uh, asking about. Uh, I think many of my poems can be read uh, with years, years later, because uh, often I write about existential questions. They are not so much linked to uh, a special occasion. Uh, for example, I, I have these poems about war in the smell of snow, and it is the war in Syria, uh, the civil war, which is so awful, uh, which uh, uh, brought these poems. But I do not mention Syria, I just mention war, because so much is uh, uh, from one wall would be like another wall. So you can uh, you can read them without knowing that it is Syria or which which wall uh, I'm thinking of. And so it will be with many of my my poems. Um, so I I myself I use the earlier poems I, when I read aloud uh, for an audience. I I often use elder poems as well because they could have been written today and I can use them. Mm. Well, your work is also shadowed by your family experience in the Second World War, isn't it? And certainly that's the case of uh, uh, Maria Stepanova's work also, um, that there is that shadow. Yeah, um, I think we have that in common. Yeah. Um, I've got a question, another question from Neil Munro, uh, to, to both of Maria and Sasha. The allusions to Eliot are so interesting in, in the poem. Um, is the Eliot present in the Russian? And does Maria see herself as being in a kind of dialogue with previous poets? So that's specifically a question um, for Maria in relation to Eliot, but I think the question of dialogue with previous poets also um, relates to Pia. But would, uh, would Maria like to talk about her dialogue with Eliot? Uh Yes, I, 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 I would try to, and uh, uh, yes, Eliot belongs to, to the Russian uh, Eliot in his, uh, well, as, uh, in, uh, as uh, the uh, English originals, uh, and the Russian translation uh, made brilliantly in the 1960s by Andrei Sergeyev, they both belong to the fabric of, of the Russian original. And uh, it was important to me because I don't uh, suppose that uh, transforming uh, a lang the language of love into the language of war 
is something common only to uh, to the Russian poetry. It is an, an, an experience that is similar for maybe all the empires or former empires I know. And uh, so I am in these two poems in Spolia and uh, The War of the Beasts. I am quoting a, a good number of uh, the uh, English and American modernists, uh, Eliot here, and uh, uh, I draw heavily on, uh, on Pound uh, in, in the Spolia, uh, because I suppose that the experience of uh, the 20th century is something we are sharing. It's a shared heritage and a shared burden. What is different in the Russian original and the English translation is uh, not maybe not not as much the folk things as the early early but non anonymous uh, Russian poetry uh, written in the Middle Ages. Uh, I am using this tale of uh, of uh, Igor's battle, Slova Polko Igoreve written in the 20s, uh, sorry, in the 12th century, uh, a poem about a military uh, exploration that quickly became a disaster. And uh, Sasha is transmitting it into the territory of English verse. Thank you. Um, Pia, did, how, how do you feel your work is engaging with the poets who've been important to you? There certainly is a dialogue and sometimes uh, it is hidden or only recognized by few. Other times I simply have a note in the end of the book and say hello to Ekeluf or who it might be. Uh, so I send a greeting to some of the, uh, the poets uh, I'm in dialogue with. But it's, it's funny to see here, uh, Maria, you, you quote uh, Celan. And it is one of the expressions which Sasha does not translate into something else. There, Sasha, of course, used the whole Ceylon uh, quotation. And I have in another poem, Die Niemand Rose. And I mm -hmm. think that <laughs> uh, words like that can will come up. Uh, they, uh, it's, they are suddenly a part of our vocabulary. And uh, yeah, our, our language is growing from what has been uh, written before. And uh, I think that uh, if we as poet, uh, poets uh, should uh, cross borders in our writings, then we have to know the tradition and know what has been before us. So it's extremely important to be in that kind of dialogue. And I can see Maria, you are really <laughs> doing the same. I think also what's extraordinary is the dialogue that you, Pia, and you, Maria, have with your translators. Um, and the way in which that's changed, I think, in the past 20 years or so, the processes involved with now email and so on, uh, whereas yeah. previously a lot of it would have been person-to-person -person meetings. Yes. Um, have, have your translation practices changed? Um, was Sasha being the translator here? I think the translation in general, literary translations, changed quite a lot. They've been huge um, shifts, partly uh, because uh, we're just so much more global and people move around a great deal more. And there are many more people, for example, dual heritage who are translating. So, um, oh, well, I'll talk about Russian particularly because that's what I know. There are so many um, uh, Russian Americans and uh, Russian British who are translating work with really fantastic cultural awareness of both British or American life, but also Russian culture. And, and that brings a kind of whole new level to translation. Um, in the Soviet period, of course, it was really limited the amount of contact you could have with either culture. And of course there were amazing translations, but just the general field and the awareness um, is, is really, is, is, is brilliant and interesting. And I, I think we all really benefit from that. There's this sort of sh shifting, um, uh, globalization, I suppose, in literary mm -hmm. culture, which is, to my mind, a, a good thing. However, um, else globalization can be seen. Yeah, We've, I've got a question here um, 
from uh, Sean O'Shaw wanting to know in Russian and Russia and in Denmark, how popular is poetry and how might it become more popular? How much has the audience for poetry changed in, in Russia in particular? Uh, Maria? Yeah, I just needed to put the sound on. Uh, well, uh, when I am getting this, uh, that, that, that's an excellent question, but uh, I always feel a bit guilty when I'm answering it uh, and uh, I do it from time to time because I suppose that there is a certain level of expectations towards the Russian reading audience uh, that we cannot really face. Uh, the usual uh, print round of a poetry book is more or less the same everywhere. Uh, I suppose in, Den in Denmark, uh, it is the same as in Britain or in Russia. That is some 500 copies, maybe a thousand if you're lucky. And uh, it's been like that since the, uh, since the since Soviet times. And uh, I don't think uh, it is a bad thing uh, because uh, there is a certain idea I wouldn't really li like to, to, to prove. But I have a feeling that uh, the moment when the general audience uh, turns towards poetry, usually it is signifying the start of something really bad, some historical serve, a catastrophe, a war, something awful that one is unable to face without this secret tool of poetry that maybe it doesn't explain a lot, but at least it gives us a chance to ask questions in a different way. And uh, people were reading poetry in the concentration camps uh, during the times of sieges, revolutions, uh, whatever else. And uh, I suppose it wasn't just for the pleasure of it. It was because it somehow helped uh, answering or posing the question. But do we need uh, more bad things to be happening? No, I don't suppose so. So, yeah. You also have different readerships though, don't you? You have a readership as a poet and you have a readership as a cultural commentator, as a memoirist. Um, people are reading different kinds of books of yours. Are, are you aware of that difference in how you write? Mm, yeah. Well, um, um, and uh, again, that, uh, that, um, maybe that, that is a problem. I'm never, I'm never trying to, to change my writing voice for the sake of gathering a certain audience. Uh, I love and respect my readers, and I suppose that uh, to do them due, I have to be very precise, and that's what I am pursuing when writing. I never know exactly what I am thinking of something until I've written written it down, and uh, so if I'm lucky, I'm being read as well. But uh, speaking in, in general, uh, the Russian uh, the Russian audience is not so huge as it used to be in the Soviet times in the 1950s or 1960s, uh, when books were printed in uh, tens of thousands of copies, and uh, it was a natural thing. But at the time, people were devoid of any other ways of entertaining themselves. They had poetry and football. No, no mm. movies, no, no, no rock stars, no, 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 no TV series. And uh, well, good for poetry and uh, bad for people, I suppose. Uh, I think that uh, that the current situation is much more natural and uh, I'm fine with it. But your, but your poetry has changed though, hasn't it? The poetry that we have in this book is very different to what you were writing uh, 20 years ago. Yes, and that's a result of, of a number of things, but uh, maybe it's an outcome, it's an outcome of, of the political climate changing. 
the hugest shift I've ever made as a as a poet was uh, when writing Spolia after the war in Ukraine started. Uh, for me, it was um, the whole thing had an explosive potential. Um, not on, regarding not only our everyday lives, but uh, the way Russian culture is going to move forward. And I had a feeling that things are falling apart and I wanted to fix this particular moment to find a, an equivalent for it. And it just was not done in, 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 uh, in the classic metro and rhyme mode. And so I started trying something else. Mm -hmm. uh, Pia, what, what, um, would you like to say something about the, the audience for poetry in, in Denmark? I, I would like to make a comment to, to Maria because uh, uh, when you are talking about what is falling apart, then I was thinking of that's why I write, I try to write these five books. Uh, that's why uh -huh. I try to build up a whole system and, and, and really find a structure. It's not a mirror mm -hmm. from the world, but I try to do the opposite. It's a, a, a contrast to what I, I see around me. Uh, so, so therefore, uh, I, I have chosen to, to do nothing else but write these poems for perhaps 10 years uh, in, in order to, to build up uh, something which can uh, have a structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A shelter or a, yeah, a safe space, something solid to, yeah, that's what I was actually wanted uh, well, I wanted to ask you, uh, since uh, since I've been reading and rereading uh, your poetry, uh, I love the idea of of uh, writing as a as a special process, as making oneself uh, moving forward with something. And I wanted to ask about the the idea, the concept behind uh, behind the series and so it was keeping the world in order yeah. despite everything yeah. mm -hmm. exactly but uh, it's mm -hmm. a different method this time uh, mm -hmm. i have never known what the next book would be like when i wrote during uh -huh. many years and uh, even not the next poem but one day the last day in july 2013 I suddenly saw five books in front of me. I was staring out in all the green and it was not, uh, uh, it, it was just there. Uh, it was not a euphoric uh, situation, but, but uh, it was a possibility which opened up for me. I saw, uh, yeah, only the, the four of them. <laughs> I saw uh -huh. five books. Uh, I saw uh, the titles of all of them. I saw the colors of uh, the cover and even the color of the types. And I thought that uh, if I go into this, if I try to write this book, try to grasp this, I have to, to take 10 years out of my life and do it. And I did not know, of course, if I was able to, but when a poet, uh, uh, get a visions like this, then there's nothing, you have to try. Then I heard in the radio one man say, if I have a goal, but not a date, then it's a dream. And I thought I will go into this uh, as, as a dream. Uh, I, I, I give it a try and uh, yeah, it's growing. I'm writing on uh, number f uh, five now. But but it so has the dream is coming with, true. Uh -huh. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, I have not uh, been working like that before, so I have not had a concept. And when I wrote on the first book, uh, the Taste of Steel, of course I got the ideas to the next book as well. So I, I opened up some folders on my computer, and every time I got an idea, I put it in the folder. And when I came to the next book, I opened up, and it was like a treasure test. Uh, but I put all the treasures in there, you see. So, but uh, the, the good thing about this method was that uh, 
the, the energy was, uh, if I'd made a note uh, or a few lines, I could remember what to do. And it was like a catapult which sent me away. So it has been such a special time with these books. I like the idea of those folders. I rather like the uh, sacratiki that uh, Maria was talking about us before. Um, I've got a very relevant question now from Hannah Busk Nielsen uh, for Pia. Uh, you mentioned uh, Kierkegaard several times in The Taste of Steel, and in Smell of Snow, you emphasize the breath. Is your grounding in existentialism developing in a Buddhist direction? <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> oh. I'm not able to answer that, but I like the question very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, when you read uh, uh, The Smell of Snow, uh, that, I mean, it's so much about breathing. And the, uh, so I, I understand her question very well. And I'm, I have become much more aware of breathing during writing. Uh, that book, and that's why I write about the senses. That I I want to be more aware about the senses. They will also always be in poets' works. Uh, we cannot write poems without uh, using the senses. But I'm try to trying to investigate them now, one for one. And I've got a question for Maria from uh, Skeptic Forty One. Um, your culture, intellect, and language are universal, like Russian music. Can poetry overcome the stupid political divide that prevents us from closer knowledge of our Russian friends? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I suppose that's what, uh, what poetry actually does. But what we need is uh, more translators and uh, even more, we need more readers because uh, what is going on in contemporary Russian poetry is just wildly interesting. And uh, it is developing, uh, it is different and uh, still it is existing in the same mind space as the British or American poetry. And uh, it deals with the same problems. And I suppose that's one more point where, uh, where written culture is becoming more and more global, not in terms of words and styles, but where we all are uh, facing the same number of questions. Uh, and uh, all we need is a dialogue. All we need is this conversation to, 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 to be started. I think that's a, a great note on which to end this discussion. I'd like to thank uh, Maria Stepanova and her translator, Sasha Dugdale and Pia Tuftrup. I'd like to thank David McDuff for his wonderful translations that you've been hearing tonight. And I'd also like to thank uh, Peter Hebden from Newcastle Centre for the Literary Arts, who's been handling uh, this event on the technical side. So, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone watching for joining us tonight this wonderful reading and discussion, which will be available afterwards on YouTube. Um, so if you've come in halfway through, you will very shortly be able to see the whole event on YouTube. Thank you very much. <laughs>